friends, welcome back to Bible Time with Johnny. If you have a Bible or your electronic device, meet me in the book of Galatians chapter 1. If you join us last time, we looked and unpacked the first five verses of Galatians. And today, we're going to look at the second section, which is verses 1 to verses 10. And, and really, this is a beautiful epistle. This is a letter that Paul writes to various churches in the region of Galatia. And one of the reasons he writes this letter is because there's a lot of confusion that kind of sprung up when it comes to biblical teaching in this time. And, and so you need to remember they were spreading misleading teachings saying that faith in Jesus wasn't enough. And there were these people, and if you were here last time, I don't know if you remember their names, they were the Judaizers. And they said, hey, in order to become part of God's family, you have to be circumcised. In order to be part of God's family, you have to follow rules and religious traditions and all these things that the Jews used to practice. And so today we're going to tackle verses 6 to 10. And we're going to partition this section into three. You need to remember that chapters and verses were added later in the 13th century. So one of the reasons we kind of partition this is so either it will be helpful for you to understand this a little bit better. So just look at this as an outline. So we're going to call verses 6 to 7. We're going to call this section the deviation. The deviation, or if you want a different word, you can call it the detour. And then from verses 8 to 9, we're going to call this the consequence. The consequence. And then for verse 10, we're going to call this the ambition. The ambition. So I want us to read verses 6 to 10 to kind of have the big picture in mind. Because I think it'll be helpful as we tackle each section. I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So this is the first section that we're going to call the deviation. Now, one of the things that Paul does right off the bat is introducing the issue. It's introducing this confusion that kind of sprung up in all of these churches. Really, one of the things that happened is that these people had taken a detour from the way of Jesus. And notice the first few words in verse 6. I am astonished. I am shocked. I am amazed. So picture someone that, that gave you bad news and that left you disappointed. For Paul, wasn't just a doctrinal issue. This was not just a theological issue for Paul. You need to remember, for him, it was personal. This is the guy who had invested in them. He spent time, energy, and even some of his finances to invest for a long time in the lives of these people, in the lives of these churches that have deserted and kind of deviated from the gospel and have settled for a cheap version of Jesus. And so imagine this is what's happening. These people not only deserted the gospel, they deviated from the gospel, but they did it so quickly. And this is what happens in verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. So it wasn't just that they took a detour from the gospel. The issue is that it happened so quickly. Now, I don't know if you remember the parable of the sower in the gospels, but in Luke, in Luke 8... Jesus tells a parable of a farmer who went out to plant a seed. And I don't know if you remember this parable, that, but this seed fell in different places, like a rocky ground, among thorns, and uh, some of them kind of landed in good soil. And Jesus goes on to say that some of the seeds that, that fell in rocky ground are like people who are really excited to hear the message. They're happy. But what happens? When trouble comes, they give up. And the seeds among thorns represent people who hear the message, but when life's worries and all of these things happen, they dis get distracted and completely disregard the message. But the seeds on good soil represent people who hear the message and they hold on to that message. And over time, they produce a huge harvest. If, if it's like if Paul was referencing back to this parable and saying that many of the churches in Galatia, they heard the message of the gospel, but it didn't fall in good soil. Right? Because they got distracted. They deviated. They took a detour from the way of Jesus. And as a result, we see this. They turned to a different gospel. 
So what are some practical signs that the seed of the gospel has fallen in good soil? So just look at your own life as you've heard the message of the gospel, as maybe you've attended church, maybe you go to Bible studies, you attend different Christian gatherings. So what are some things, practical things, that tells me that I am living in a way that pleases God? Welcome to Course 5 Overview of the New Testament in the In-Depth Bible Study Academy. My name's Ashley and I just want to encourage you to come get this course and to learn loads of information about the New Testament. We're going to be overviewing, of course, the whole New Testament. We're going to be going through all of the Gospels, Acts, all of the epistle letters and revelation. We're gonna go through each book and what the purpose is, what the author is, what the occasion was. So you will be getting video teachings from me, Taylor, and Mentor Mama. Along with that, you're gonna be getting homework, extra readings, guides, video notes, everything like that to help you in your study of the New Testament. I hope that you guys will consider getting this course and I can't wait to see you in there. Bye. Number one spiritual hunger. In other words, you have an increasing desire to know God more deeply because here's the problem. If you're not craving God deeper, there's a problem in your spiritual life. So there's spiritual hunger. Number two, fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. By this, I mean that there's a tangible evidence of internal spiritual transformation in your life. If you're not producing fruits in your life, it's because you're most likely not abiding in Christ. And the third thing is endurance, endurance. If you've ever planted anything in your backyard or your house or wherever you live, then you know that good soil allows the seed to take deep roots. That means that when things are about to go down in your life, you're able to hold on to your faith without deviating from the truth. Now notice Paul's main concern on this text is that these people were pretty much put in a different jersey. Imagine if you're a fanatic of a sport, of a football or basketball, and you're watching your favorite team. Imagine if you wore the jersey of the opposite team. That's what these people were doing. And Paul's point was that you cannot follow Jesus and also swim in a sea of religious pluralism. And this is what these people were doing. In fact, look at verse 7. They turned to a different gospel, which it is no gospel at all. Remember that the very definition of gospel means good news. And when you add elements that complicate the beautiful message of the gospel, you end up turning the good news into bad news because you have to follow rules. You have to do all these legalistic things. So far, the church in Galatia, they had been characterized by four things. So desertion, they had abandoned the message of the gospel. Number two, deviation, they had turned to a different gospel, right? Number three is confusion. They didn't know the message of the gospel. And number four is perversion. They incorporated aspects of legalism to the message of the gospel. Now, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go to this Islamic center. And the imam, the religious leader there, was so gracious and kind to allow me to have a conversation with him because I really wanted to hear what Muslims believe. And, and one of the things that happened is that I started listening to what they believe. And the problem is that Muslims believe in a myth that is predicated upon moralistic, therapeutic deism. And I hope that concept is going to show up on the, on the screen because I know it's really deep and it sounds really complicated. In other words, they believe in a God, right? That's deism. And they feel good. They, need to, they feel like they need to be good. That is kind of the moralistic aspect of their faith. And number three, they want to feel good, right? A lot of us, we want to feel good. And kind of that's the therapeutic aspect of their faith. And the problem with this teaching is that it doesn't reflect the gospel. And even though as Christians, we don't go around saying that we believe in a lot and Muhammad and, and the Muslim prophet, this moralistic therapeutic deism philosophy has infiltrated a lot of churches today. Maybe your church, maybe my church, people or places that we've been part of in our lives. And that couldn't be further from the truth of the gospel. That's why we have to be extremely careful not deviating to a different gospel. Now we're going to move to our second section from verses 8 to 9. In verses 8 to 9, Paul says that if anyone preaches a different gospel, let them be under God's 
curse. And notice how he repeats the same idea in both verses to amplify the emphasis on the consequence. Let me give you an example. I don't know if you watch Survivor, but it's a TV reality show. And let's say that you're in a show like Survivor, right? And the only way to kind of win this life changing prize is by following specific instructions. Now, some participants, they claim they have better instructions and with shortcuts, but you've been warned. If you deviate from the original instructions and you're not just out of the game, but you're completely removed from the island. Now, imagine Galatia was full of these people who chose to follow other type of instructions, right? They were essentially voting themselves off the island. And the situation Paul was addressing was anything but a game. It, was a re- it wasn't a reality show. In fact, these false teachers were not just risking being canceled on social media. They were gambling with damnation itself, with their eternal destination. And you might not be struggling with legalistic tendencies like some of the people in Galatia, but you might be tempted to compromise your faith in other ways. Maybe to make it more applicable for you and I. Maybe you have this this pressure to conform to popular culture. Maybe you have this conviction or, or this pressure to choose convenience over the hard truth of the gospel. But by doing that, you're risking your relationship with God and the integrity of your faith. So remember that there's a consequence, not only to those who twist the message of the gospel, but also for those who pull away from that truth. Lastly, let's move to our third section that we're going to name the ambition. Let's read verse 10 again. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I will not be a servant of Christ. Now, let me put this into an illustration. Let's say you're a young, ambitious professional who works for one of the biggest companies of your town. One day, your boss comes up to you and asks you to make a presentation to a potential client. So you're ready because you know that you're really good at this and you know that you're gonna make an amazing sale pitch to this person. Now, the only catch is that your boss wants you to exaggerate the capabilities of the product that you're trying to sell. In other words, he wants you to lie. Now, you know this is really unethical and it goes against your principles and your values, but you also know that this is a great opportunity to fast track your career. So let me ask you a question if you're watching this. What would you do? What would you do in that situation? The Apostle Paul found himself in multiple situations where he had to kind of choose between pleasing people and pleasing God. And in this context that we're reading verse 10, Paul decided to stand firm in his commitment to the truth of the gospel. Now, you need to understand, Paul was a big deal. He was like a celebrity pastor back then. He was known by different people, different congregations, different churches all over that region. He could have perfectly preached this really relevant message to this church, kind of to keep his reputation. But he was okay with risking his popularity and even losing the approval of people that he loved. Why? Because his ambition was to choose God's approval, not people's applause. Let me say that again. His ambition was to chase God's approval, not people's applause. And when we chase people's applause, when we chase people's approval, we find ourselves in a never-ending performance, constantly adjusting our script. Which leads me to a question for you today. What are some areas in your life where you find yourself seeking people's applause? more than God's approval. What are some areas in your life where you find yourself seeking people's applause more than God's approval? You know, as I was studying this text a few days ago, I found myself just noticing the amount of churches that have embraced alternative gospels in pursuit of relevance. But brother and sister, if you're watching this today, let me tell you, God doesn't want you to be relevant. God has not called you, your church, your pastors, your leaders to be relevant. God has called all of us to be faithful. And we should be faithful over relevant. We don't want to be popular. In fact, Jesus told us that the world was going to hate us. We need to be faithful for the sake of the gospel, not deviating from the truth, knowing that there will be consequences. And our ambition should be chasing God's approval, not people's applause. This is my call for you. 
We need to stick to the message that calls us to believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ as the fundament truth of our faith. This is the message that we're called to uphold, affirm, and share with unwavering commitment. I hope that you were able to enjoy this quick study on the book of Galatians. As a reminder, if you go down to the description, you're going to find an extra resource that's going to take you in a deeper way through the book of Galatians. And remember that we also want to support Coffee and Bible Time. This is their ministry. And so if you're able to go down and buy that resource as you study the book of Galatians with us.